Greetings. Thanks to everyone for coming out to our author group reading. This reading is brought to you by Strong Women Strange Worlds, which is a group of authors supporting authors. Our mission is to elevate the voices of women and other underrepresented gender identity authors of science fiction, fantasy, and horror through our events like our bi-monthly virtual quick read session. You can find out more about Strong Women Strange Worlds in the handout we've provided in the chat and by visiting a website, our website, a link of which will be added to the chat. And our website is strongwomenstrangeworlds.weebly.com. I am your host today, Kate, and you can find out more about me in the provided handout as well. Please note that the recording of this session by the audience is not allowed, and recordings of electronic communications, including Zoom meetings and webinars, without permission is illegal. Today, we will be fe featuring six authors, R.S.A. Garcia, Adrian Selt, Brenda Clough, Elaine Burns, Jessica Nettles, and Emmy Iterani. Each author will have eight minutes to read. Our first reader is R.S.A. Garcia. R.S.A. Garcia lives in Trinidad and Tobago. Her debut sci-fi mystery, Lex Talionis, received a Publishers Weekly starred review and became an Amazon bestseller. She has published short fiction in outlets such as Clark's World Magazine, and she is currently a finalist for the Theodore A. Sturgeon Memorial Award and the Ignite Award. RSA, take it away. Hi, everyone. Pleased to meet you all. My name is RSA Garcia, and I will be reading to you today from a scene where we are introduced to our main character and several of the beings that are going to help her on her quest to rediscover her identity and her past. Colin usually knew who wouldn't make it. After a while, you got a sense. Not the patients that yelled and moaned and cried and complained, they had a chance. The quiet ones, they were the ones who had to see two first. Today, Colin had a sick feeling in his gut the minute he walked into the trauma room. It didn't stop him from doing his job, but in the back of his mind, the objective part of him whispered, waste of time. Less than 15 minutes later, bloody clothes in a pile on the floor at his feet and a slim, still body on the floating gurney before him. He watched as the medbot withdrew glimmering threads from the monitor patches on the girl's body. Grey tentacles folded the sensors into a spherical body before the bot floated up to its ceiling station. Patient has expired, the medbot said in a soft unisex voice. The yellow dot of its camera swiveled its circumference until it found him. Time death noted for the record. He did so as the new attendant stared, her face saying, how did this happen? How did I feel? It wasn't your fault, he said as he stuck his hands in the sanitizer built into the wall and felt it suck away his gloves. A blast of coldness followed as it cleaned his hands. Colin focused on it, trying to ignore the dull frustration, the come down from the adrenaline rush of action to the reality of failure. She looked up at him, shaking her head. But she died. She was dead before she got here. You want to start the paperwork? The door slid open as the new attendant exited, calm in hand, ready to begin reporting her report. He glanced back at the prone body as he withdrew his dry hands from the sanitizer, sadness washing over him. The dead girl looked young, too young to be so broken, and he hadn't saved her. God, I hate this job sometimes. He turned to go. But the tinted doors to the corridor slid open again on a whisper. Something small and green flashed past him. There was a crash as a tree went down. The medbot sounded a high-pitched whine that made him cover his ears. He swung around in time to see its yellow eyes spark and go dark a second before the noise came to a blessed end. What the hell? A biped sat on the dead girl's chest. Hairless, it had green skin stretched paper thin over an almost human skeletal structure void of genitalia. Its arms and legs ended in four long, thin digits. Its large, round head had enormous black orbs over two tiny holes Colin took for nostrils and a lipless mouth. It sat in a lotus position, head lowered, with long arms wrapped around its torso and clasped together in the middle of its back. He reached out to haul the thing off, and the next thing he knew, he had slammed into the crash cart in the corner of the room. He sat up with a grunt, his back screaming where he'd impacted on a sharp corner, 
and barely had time to get his legs out of the way as a huge gray figure strode into the room. Seven feet tall, the Algorand marched past Colin toward the goon. The brown toga he wore, which left the breed flaps on his wide chest exposed, made a sibilant sound as he passed. Come now, come to Andraju, the Algorand growled in universal to the creature sitting on the goon. Andraju stood next to the goon as though unsure how to proceed. You've caused enough trouble. Let's go before security arrives. The creature did not move. Colin pulled himself to his feet, ignoring a sharp, unpleasant tingling under his skin. Come on, I said, if we leave now, together I will forget this when we get back to camp. The creature remained motionless. So, Colin began, but Andraju hissed, oblivious to all but the unmoving creature. The Algorand reached out and grabbed the animal's shoulder. A second later, his muscular arm shot up and back as though slapped away. He cried out, a shocked look on his gray face, his black, marble-sized eyes wide. Grabbing his arm, Andraju cursed fluently in his own language. So that's what happened to me. It looked as painful as it felt. Is this animal yours? Colin asked. If so, you'd better get it out of here. Neither of you are allowed. His voice died as his gaze fell on the girl again. The sitting alien had not moved an inch, but the girl had. Her chest rose, then fell, rose, then fell. The creature rode her breathing, its arms still wrapped around itself. She's dead. She has to be. The medbots never wrong. The girl arched away from the bed, her body making an impossible curve like a bull. Her head dug into the plastic sheet under her, and the veins in her bruised neck stood out like cords. The white sheet they had half pulled over her fell away from lean arms as her fist dug into the goon. One of the monitor patches peeled off and fell to the floor. A strangled gargle came from between her puffed lips. Still straddling her, the creature stretched one stick thin arm toward the girl's head and touched the center of her forehead. Her body collapsed as if a string had been cut, and then she was holding the outstretched finger, her hand clutching the aliens in what looked like a death grip. Her whole body shook from the effort. Her eyes were green, Colin realized, bloodshot but incredibly green. A sacred host, Anjaji whispered. What does this mean? Colin did not, could not, reply. She was dead. I watched her die. The girl's breath sounded harsh, each one a faint moon. She struggled to get an elbow under her, but fell back onto the gurney, still clutching the alien's hand. Gasping with pain, she did not break eye contact with the alien on her chest. The creature leaned down, as if listening for something. Seconds passed before the girls choked out two short words. Colin could just barely hear. Her eyes closed and her hand fell back on the gurney, still holding her savior's finger. Pest, the Algorand said, but Colin caught the undertone of confusion and fear. The Algorand had no idea what had just happened, neither did he for that matter, but he knows this thing and he can help. Above them, the medbot suddenly reared to life, flexing tentacles and swiveling its camera eye. Patient revived. It announced, prepping for surgery. It began reattaching the sensors to the monitor patches. Ida me, she said, Ida me, help them in Latin. Who uses Latin anymore outside of medicine and law school? The creature leaped from the bed with surprising agility and landed on Andraju, its long arms encircling the short fat neck. I leave it there for today. Thank you for listening. I'm Arasi Garcia. You can find out more about my work on Clarksville or on my website, arasigarcia.com. Or come hang out with me on Twitter. I'm at Arasi Garcia. Thank you, RSA. That was so good. This is my problem. Every time I come to one of these, my TBR pile just gets bigger and bigger. Our second reader is Adrienne Selt. Adrienne Selt is the author of three novels, including End of the World House, Invitation to a Bonfire, which is currently being adapted for TV by AMC, and The Daughters, which won a 2015 Penn Southwest Book Award for Fiction. Her work has appeared in The New York Times, The New Yorker, The O. Henry Prize Stories, Strange Horizons, and elsewhere. And she's also our cartoonist. Adrienne, over to you. Hi, thanks for having me, guys. Um, so I'm just going to read from the beginning because when you write a time loop novel, it's really hard to choose 
an excerpt that is uh, representative of that. So I'm going to give you the rest of the setup instead. Um, and by the way, if you sign up for my newsletter, I will pick one uh, winner to get a free copy of End of the World House. And the newsletter also contains, uh, it's mostly cartoons and musings. So it's very low spam content, <laughs> just fun, weird animals. By the time they reached the Louvre, Bertie and Kate were nearly running. It wasn't unusual for their walks to turn into unplanned races. Both were in the habit of strolling a half step in front of people. And when they were together, this could become a problem. First, Bertie would move in front of Kate. Then Kate would pick up her pace to match Bertie's and so on and so forth until they looked at each other and broke into a sprint. It had been that way since they were 15. That is, some 15 years ago, and on ordinary days, they both embraced it, competing to reach an imaginary finish line, celebrating whoever won. But today, despite wanting to arrive at the museum on time, their mutual fear of looking un-French was helping them to approach moderation. At the end of the Rue de Rivoli, they slowed down and used each other as mirrors to readjust their outfits. A tug of the shirt when Kate lifted her eyebrow and a twist of the skirt when Bertie sucked her teeth. The morning was hazy, with a fog that wasn't quite willing to resolve into rain, but was heavy enough to sit on the women's hair and dampen their jackets. Kate reached into her bag for an actual mirror, which she used to apply a fresh layer of lipstick. They'd come to the museum at the invitation of a man Kate had met the night before in a bar, and she claimed not to have decided yet whether she wanted to impress him. What are your priorities art-wise, Bertie asked. She had a handkerchief around her neck, meant to look chic, but also useful as a breathing filter when they passed through the areas still smoky from the last round of bombs. The tracking app they had poured over on the plane attributed responsibility to a terrorist faction from the suburbs who'd arrived via commuter rail wearing innocuous clothes and backpacks with gunpowder sewn into the lining. Now, Bertie shifted the knot of her handkerchief back to the side into its more fashionable position. Do you want to hear something dumb? I kind of want to see the Mona Lisa. That's not dumb, said Kate. Everyone wants to see the Mona Lisa. I mean, that's why it's dumb. Usually it's surrounded by a huge crowd, like hundreds of tourists all crammed around this tiny painting, which is probably only an okay painting and which they only like because it's famous. So what, are you going to commune with it now that you're the only one there? This had been the man's offer, as they sipped their drinks and walked, watched him glimmer lasciviously. Private entrance into the museum, which today was technically closed. If she was honest with herself, Bertie had in fact gotten a shiver of pleasure from the idea. I deserve it, she'd thought. If not me, who? But she wasn't about to be quite that honest with Kate, who would only make fun of her. N Never mind, she said. We can skip it. I don't care. No, said Kate. We should see it. You're right. She snapped her lipstick shut and stowed it away again. Do you really think people don't like the Mona Lisa? Bertie shrugged. I just don't think most people have really thought about it. They'd come to Paris because the tickets were cheap. First, there'd been a spate of hijackings, and then the bombings, and a period of general unrest. No one was willing to call it a world war, but that was semantics. Now the borders were opening back up under the auspices of a ceasefire. And though most Americans were still too nervous to travel, a few of the tourist boards were giving it the old college try. Kate and Bertie chose Paris because they felt that the French advertisements did the best job of flirting with the overall sense that the world was ending without ever actually stating outright that this might be your last chance for a vacation. Also, Kate was moving in a month, so this was kind of a last hurrah. Bertie knew it would have been smarter to put her money and energy into finding a place in the city, finally moving out of the dismal Mountain View apartment she'd only rented to be near Kate. But that would have meant recognizing that Kate was really going to leave. So she'd suggested a trip instead. Anyway, the commute from San Francisco was hellish, more so now that the 101 was gone and the 280 was the only freeway option between the city and the South Bay. It was like God died the day that they shut the 101 for good. People actually cried in the streets. In principle, Bertie was a cartoonist, but for years now she'd made her money doing illustrations for a large tech company in Silicon Valley, 
one that liked to appear lighthearted and approachable to the public so that they could sell more ads, which worked surprisingly well. Even cynical people seemed reassured by the company's palette of bright colors and its dinosaur avatar, which Bertie had now drawn in a thousand absurd situations, including on a rocket ship and driving a school bus, as well as learning I Think Therefore I Am from René Descartes with a book clutched in its tiny hands. The company paid Bertie more than she felt she was worth, so she drew it any way they wanted, as many times as they wanted, along with a rotating multicultural cast of nameless humans who accompanied the dinosaur on its adventures. Bertie was supposed to be working on a graphic novel, too, on her own time, but these days she rarely had the energy. Not because of her job, so much as the malaise that lay over everything. Politics, global war, world hunger, just everything. Kate had wanted to be an essayist, but that was years ago. She gave it up in favor of directing publicity and fundraising for a nonprofit that lobbied to improve the quality of school lunches. It was theoretically a more selfless career than Bertie's, but Bertie didn't see it that way. After all, Kate liked being in charge. She liked the power. Whereas Bertie was indifferent to her job, which sometimes made her feel like she had less self than anyone. At least if she'd hated it, she could have quit. But nobody wanted to hear you complain about leaving your okay job with good health, and health insurance. Not at a time when the U.S. had sudden, suddenly had honest-to-God refugees streaming towards the coasts from the South and the Midwest, finding not much in the way of aid or sympathy. So she kept going every day, sometimes enjoying herself, sometimes spending whole afternoons reading the comment threads at the end of online advice columns, letting rage and disappointment wash all over her in order to reach the rare and blissful moments of catharsis. That morning... The crowd around the glass pyramid in the Cour Napoleon was sparse, just a few tourists taking photographs of the grounds and some Parisians passing through on their way to work. Near the fountain, a mother and her small daughter threw pieces of croissant to the birds, and a few yards behind them, a group of four people was peering at something at the top of a tower, shielding their eyes with their hands. A few days before, when Bertie and Kate had walked by the same court courtyard while heading to the Tuileries Garden, the space had been packed, including a line of museum goers that snaked back half a block. But since the Louvre was closed today, most people had made other plans. The man from the night before had told them he had connections and could get them in for a private viewing if they showed up by 8.45 in the morning and gave his name, Javier, at the entrance. It sounded like a delicious secret, almost too good to be true. They'd found Javier at a jazz club somewhere in the 5th arrondissement an old place stuck in a cellar which boasted a surprisingly good band and a crowd of middle-aged Frenchmen who were eager, eager to dance with youths from abroad and buy them red wine for five euros a glass. The mist turned into a drizzle and Kate took Bertie's hand. Oh, hi, said Bertie. And in answer, Kate gave her hand a squeeze, the same gentle greeting they'd shared for years, but now at a castle in Paris in a light Parisian rain. And I'll leave it there. Ah, I'm telling you, I'm pretty sure I'm one of the characters in that book. <laughs> and it's accurate, but I don't love that you're like, oh, the world is ending, but I'm going on vacation because, oh, that would be me. <laughs> that was so good. All right. Our third reader is Brenda Clough. Brenda W. Clough is the first female Asian American science fiction writer, first appearing in print in 1984. Her novella, Maybe Sometime, was a finalist for both the Hugo and the Nebula Awards and became the novel Revise the World. Marion Halcombe, a series of 11 neo-Victorian thrillers, appeared in 2021. Go ahead, Brenda. Hi. Uh, these are, You can tell by the cover, cover, these are novels, Victorian thrillers, and this book is set in 1858. Our heroine, Marion Halcombe, ma got married and is six months pregnant, but now her husband is in jail. And so in this bit, Marion is visiting the lawyer who's defending him. Mr. Plockton was the founder of the firm, old but still hale, a cautious and reserved man with deep creases around his narrow mouth, further echoed by the curve of white woolly side whiskers. He sat behind a wide wooden desk that took up more than half the small room. 
It was stacked neatly with briefs in piles. And on the side of it, closest to me, was a large silver tray with the tea things and a little kettle on a spirit lamp to keep it hot. He said, Mr. Camlet's account to date is very considerable. He sipped from his own teacup. I can understand that you, Miss Halcombe, are bearing the current costs of his legal troubles. With funds that he gave to me for that purpose, I replied, you need not fear, Mr. Plockton, you shall have all the financial backing necessary to win Mr. Camlet's acquittal. I'm a cautious man, Miss Halcombe. I cannot feel that he would wish you to beggar yourself. I was surprised and slightly wary. Surely Mr. Plockton was not suggesting that he did not want to be paid. His life is worth any money to me. Have you considered perhaps that some other arrangement could be made? Remember, in my banker's warning, I realized I should not fail to consider this. To bankrupt us both and save Theo's life was all very well, but supposing the money ran out before the acquittal, I did not dare to run our finances so close. I stared at the solicitor across the wide brown ocean of his desk top. As a going concern, Mr. Camlet's publishing business is worth little without him. In any case, I am not empowered to sell it or to borrow on its value. Then allow me to make a suggestion which may not have occurred to you. He rose, creaking to his feet, and courteously refilled my cup with his own hands, adding milk and sugar before I could offer to do it myself. Then he went to the door. I assumed he was going to call for a book or document, but to my surprise, he simply turned the key in the lock. Returning, he sat in the other client's chair rather than returning to his side of the desk. In return, for some trifling personal services from you, I would be willing to adjust your accounts with the firm. The only thought that came to my mind was lace knitting. He wanted to purchase knitted lace and, sir, I guessed, in my condition, the last thing on my mind is dalliance. Your condition is precisely what makes you so attractive to the cautious legal mind, Miss Halcombe. So many lawsuits have I seen for parental maintenance. It would disgust you, dear lady. This would not be an issue with you for many months. You would not need to tell your family or your, ahem, your paramour, for there can be no unpleasant mementos of your, our experiences. I jumped to my feet, but to escape, I would have to pass close by him. I would most certainly speak, and I shall. And you are aware I shall simply declare that you made a most improper offer to me in hopes of lessening your crushing legal bills. Mr. Plotkin smiled at me, an elderly crocodile smile. A woman who has lost her virtue, that inestimable jewel, may hope for very little credence in matters of this sort. You would never make such vile selections to a married lady. And you are not a married lady, Miss Halcombe. You are a notorious and shameless character. Three quarters on the way to whoredom. Come, come now. A little adventure will make your fallen state no worse and be of mutual benefit. Boldly, I tried to sweep past him. To my complete horror, he seized the blue and gray flounce of my gown, bringing me to a halt. He put his other hand on my rounded belly, brushing aside the cloak and shawl. When I leaned in, he chuckled and pressed his whiskery face into my bosom. Over his shoulder, I snatched the tea kettle from the stand. It was not quite at the boil, but when I poured it down the back of his neck, the effect was most notable. He shrieked at the top of his lungs. Ah, you termagant! Writhing, he fell out of his chair with a crash. I dropped the tea kettle on top of him and, stepping past, turned the key in the lock. The young clerk at the desk in the outer office started to his feet. Barnaby, I said, Mr. Plockton has had an accident with the tea kettle. At his age, it may be that a doctor should be called. I passed out into the corridor just as Mr. Smithy came out of his chambers on the other across the way. Miss Halcom, oh, dear God, you above all should not have consulted Mr. Plockton alone. He sees only gentlemen clients. Say rather, the firm takes care that he sees no ladies. But then I remembered my earlier visit. You warned me, Mr. Smithy. You told me that Mr. Plockton should not hear of the case. I am so sorry I did not make my hint more plain. Mr. Smithy's curly hair seemed to stand nearly on end with fright. Let us step this way, if you would. He drew me into his office as the other clerks ran to Mr. Plockton's aid. Once they have all passed, 
I will conduct you to your carriage. Our senior partner's due to retire at the end of the year. Although his legal work is still very fine, he's eccentric, I offer. Yes, very good, eccentric. You are the soul of tact. I beg that you will in future let Mr. Hartwright consult with him. That would be my very great pleasure. I only hope he'll be sufficiently injured that he hands the case over to you. And I entirely understand you could not speak frankly about your senior partner. Ah, here is our moment. This way, if you please. Mr. Plockton's screams could still be faintly heard as I was ushered down down the hall and out through the deserted reception room into the street. My coachman was at the curb with the carriage. Mr. Smithy handed me up. Before he could shut the door, I said, Mr. Smithy, I hope you will not get into hot water yourself over the, for your gallantry. Do not fear I will forget this. You are a true gentleman and we will do business again. Mr. P- Smithy's plump face went pink and he bowed as he shut the door. And there you go. I am in love with your leading lady. I am Uh here for her. She is fantastic. Yes, girl. Yes. (sighs) I do get carried away at these sometimes. Our fourth reader is Elaine Burns. Elaine Burns is the award-winning author of the novel Wishbone and short story collection, A Perfect Life and Other Stories. Wishbone won a 2016 GCLS award for dramatic slash general fiction. A Perfect Life earned a 2016 Rainbow Award. Endurance, first in a trilogy, came out in June. She lives in Western Massachusetts. Take it away, Elaine. Thank you. Thank you, Strong Women, Strange Worlds, for this opportunity. Um, And you can follow my blog at my website, which is on the screen, to keep up with my latest. And as she said, there will be two more books in this series. Uh, The scene I'll read takes place shortly after the tour ship Endurance experiences an emergency while in orbit at Saturn. The shaking and spinning have stopped. Now the main character, Captain Lynn Randall, is going through the ship, checking on things. Um, Other characters are Mark, the first officer, Edward, the chief engineer, his assistant, Isabel. Sharon is in charge of the guests, and Petra is the ship's computer. On the bottom deck... The acrid smell of burned synthetics assaulted her before she got to the engineering suite. Through dense smoke, a row of dim emergency lights outlined the room and spots hit key control panels. Mark and Edward were reattaching a panel in the wall and Isabel Roig, assistant engineer, was sliding shut a hatch in the ceiling to the bay between decks where the retractable wings were stored. Edward flipped a switch and the suite's lights came on revealing the toll the event had taken. A fan whirred to life and the air began to clear. Wings are undamaged and secure, Isabel said. Edward said the engines were offline, but life safety systems were coming back. No loss of atmosphere, so no breaches other than the the observation deck, which because of the dome had the weakest framing. It was designed to protect the ship, the rest of the ship in case of a failure, hence the ceiling of the elevator shaft and stairway. Damages were limited to unsecured objects and physical injuries, none of which was life-threatening. A pipe broke in laundry, Mark said. There's a floating flood down there, but bots are vacuuming it up. Isabel reported Dr. Amos had a dozen patients, the four most critical in medical, the rest in their rooms. He was monitoring the med bots and two dozen guests. Lynn let out a relieved breath when Sharon called down that all passengers and crew were accounted for. She searched the faces of her staff. Nothing had sunk in yet other than a preliminary relief. They were still alive. Do we know what happened, Isabel said. Lynn shook her head. We'll have to review the logs to see what it was, but for now I'm getting reports that bots have started repairs. Engines aren't damaged, Edward said, only offline as a precaution. What do we do now, Mark asked. I thought we'd all meet in the dining room, Lynn said. The sooner guests can see us operating normally, the better. What do we tell them, he asked. The truth, we don't know, but we're working on finding answers. I sent an SOS two hours ago. We've heard nothing from anyone. Any ship within range should have responded. Worst case, the signal would have reached Mars and Earth Control the two agencies that oversaw all space operations. 
If we were on an ocean, Isabel said, I think we were hit by a rogue wave, which would hit everyone else as well. But out here, could it have been a swarm of micro debris, Edward said? An asteroid? Aliens? Mark added. Lynn raised her hands to stop them. Let's get the outside sensors rebooted. In the meantime, she said to Mark, I think we should go see for ourselves. Lynn and Mark made their way up the central stairway to the bridge deck. From a storage closet, they donned life packs and flipped on their helmets and gloves. Inside what was now an airlock around the last steps of the, to the OBS deck, they tethered to the wall and waited while the pressure equalized. At the top of the steps, Mark released the OBS hatch and peered up through what had once been the floor of a luxurious lounge, but was now the outer hull. They floated out into space. All the furnishings had been stripped away, the carpet shredded. Walls rose to knee height, and where durapanes and frames would take over to allow an almost unfettered view, nothing remained. Nothing between them and infinity. As relieved as Lynn was that no one had been up here, a little of her died to see her beloved ship so violated. She spun to take in their surroundings, noting dismally, no sign of Saturn. All around, stars and the Milky Way filled their view. Without bright Saturn, the stars popped with a surreal brilliance. They'd seen this on their trip out in the long empty stretches between planets. So where was Saturn? She focused on one bright star, maybe the sun, but larger than it would be from Saturn. To its right sat an even larger object. If that was Saturn, they were no longer in orbit or anywhere near it. She called up the ship's computer. Petra, locate Saturn. Saturn is not in the solar system, Petra replied. She tapped Mark on the shoulder to get his attention. Did you hear that? Saturn can't just vanish. Computer malfunction? She selected the bright star, identify object. Object is Toleman, designation HR 5460. That doesn't make sense, she said to Mark. We shouldn't be able to distinguish it from Regal Kent. <clears throat> but if that's Toleman, is the other Uranus? Seems too bright. Mark selected the bigger object, identify. Object is Regal, Contor Regal Contorus. Designation HR 5459. <clears throat> That's not possible, Lynn said. Petra, are you experiencing a malfunction? <clears throat> not that I'm aware of, Captain. Then where are we? We are in the Regal Centauri system. Formerly known as Alpha Centauri, the binary system is closest to Earth. Petra, stop. How did we get here? Unknown at this time. What the? They each turned, taking in the stars around them. Lynn made out constellations, blurs within the Milky Way, but definitely recognizable. She knew this sky, but didn't. She floated, turning slowly, staring at the glittery blanket above and all around them. Regal Kent? Where's our sun? Mark asked Petra. Petra gave them the coordinates. Lynn turned, but couldn't find it among the billions of stars. Too small, too far away. This simply wasn't possible. She pulled on her tether till her feet set firmly against the hull, longing to lie down, to hug the ship. She closed her eyes and became keenly aware of the hiss of her breath inside the helmet and her pulse pounding in her ears. This wasn't an unfamiliar feeling that realization after she'd stepped off the trail in the woods, gotten turned around and then couldn't find her way back. It's a stone in your gut that grows, pressing on the diaphragm, making it hard to breathe. Your scalp tingles and you know, you are lost. She switched off her mic then arced back, opening her eyes to take in the stars familiar and not, and howl loud and long like the last wolf crying to be heard, to be found, to be continued. <gasps> this, my heart, <laughs> I need to know, where is Saturn? Where is Saturn? Where did it go? Find Saturn. Come on, guys. 
<sighs> that ending. <sighs> our next, our fifth reader is Jessica Nettles. Jessica Nettles is from Powder Springs, Georgia. Her first novel is Children of Menlo Park. You can find her stories in Off the Beaten Path 4, Georgia Gothic, and A Woman Unbecoming. Join her online at jessicanettlesauthor.com, as well as on Twitter, Instagram, and on Facebook. Go ahead, Jessica. Hi, everybody. Um, just a word about A Woman Unbecoming. It is an anthology that benefits reproductive health care rights. You can purchase it on Amazon, and it is coming out in paperback this week. I'm so excited. Um, also, I'm giving away one copy of it, as well as five of these wonderful handmade bookmarks. And now on to the reading. Two black mounds of dirt greeted Skid and Kev at the base of their assigned mountain. They both were about knee high and tiny pine trees grew along the tops. What do you think they are? Skid kicked at the edge of one of them with his brown hunting boot. Kev took a squig from his steel flask. The wide brim hat he'd bought the night before that read Hunt 40 slid to his shoulders, revealing a shock of pale red hair. Indian mounds? Skid thwacked his friend's temple with his finger. There ain't no more indigenous people out here, idiot. Yeah, that's why there's them mounds. Kev swung at his friend, lost his footing, and ended up sprawled over one of the hillocks, breaking some of the taller seedlings. These can't be mounds. They don't look like they've been here that long. Skid picked one of the smaller pine sprigs from the second pile of packed dirt, and twirled it between his long fingers. Besides, if someone was buried, that means they can't be released to the universe like they should be. Kev's eyes widened. Their particles would stay here. No stardust. That's some pure evil right there. Skid nodded. Right. No stardust. He kicked a hole in the side of the mound next to him. I reckon someone tried to start a garden right here, but didn't do a very good job. You think they live close, like right on this mountain? Bobby said there were two old ones near here. They must be slipping if they're planting so close to the road. Skid rubbed some sweat out of his eyes. The morning was getting humid fast. Probably easy prey. Maybe we'll get back to base before everyone else and get the best beer. Kev started up the incline, but Skid grabbed his arm. I'm lead, remember? He released the younger man and pulled out a machete. The edge of it gleamed from where he'd sharpened it last night by the fire. He stepped between two craggy granite boulders, and he swung the blade into the brush on the other side. Kev followed, but not too close. The sun was shining through the canopy of oak and pine. Behind them, leaves rustled and bells tinkled but not loud enough for the men to hear. If they'd known the old stories and had heard the sounds, they'd have sworn there were fairies in the forest. Rhoda Lee stopped between a row of okra and white squash and leaned on her hoe. The garden was festooned in broad, prickly green leaves with splashes of golden yellow blossoms and fully open flowers of cream with a center of purple. A group of honeybees moved from the brown red sunflowers that stood shoulder height and hovered around her like guards as a random breeze ruffled her loose graying curls hanging either side of her glasses and gave her a bit of respite from the rising midsummer heat. Y'all go down there and check things out. The swarm headed into the tree line and vanished into the shadows. The broad green fronds of the squash and okra plants surrounding her rustled in response to the movement of the leaves in the trees and the kudzu that draped to one side of the yard. A musky, familiar stench floated in the gentle mid-morning breeze. It couldn't have been a year since their last visitors. Time moved faster than it used to. She pulled off her blue-flowered garden gloves, put the hoe over her shoulder, picked up a basket filled with okra fingers, red-green tomatoes, and a few golden-skinned squash, and made her way to the cabin. 
She grinned as she stepped up to the porch. Me blood, this should be fun. Hey, Kev, you see this? Adjusted the vapor rifle on his shoulder as he nibbled one of the energy bars the outfitters sold them back in town. A rough piece of thin plywood was nailed to a two-by-two two stud that leaned to one side. The plywood was painted in a faded teal and adorned with flowers. It read, Y'all don't want to do this. Leave now. Kev laughed and tore down the sign. He broke it over his wide knee and threw it to the side. Oh, that's funny. Skid dropped the wrapper on the ground. That really deterred us, didn't it? The two men slung old-fashioned machetes in front of them to cut through the tangle of weeds, vines, and random branches in the hope that using a self-made path would avail them as element of surprise. Another well-preserved pole stood in the middle of the brush like it had been there since the birth of the mountain. It looked like one of them poles that people used, used to use for power lines back in the 20th century and smelled sharp and acidic. On it was another plyboard sign. This time, a dark-skinned woman glared at them with one eyebrow arched. Hair hung in green and blue ringlets around her face. Danger ahead, gentlemen, it read in hand-painted blood-red letters. Kev dropped his blade and whipped his vapor rifle from his shoulder. Snakes, Skid! Snakes! Before Skid could stop him, the sun disappeared with only a few particles floating and dissipating in the breeze. Half the ancient pole was also missing. Damn it, Kev. Give me your weapon. You could have caught me in that fire. Skid, who'd managed to be just out of range, appeared at his fellow hunter's side. Those snakes were moving. Didn't you see that? Kev lowered the gun but held on to it. It was a stupid picture. Nothing moved. He grabbed the gun. Now let me have your gun. And that's where I'm going to stop. You can't. You cannot stop. I need to know what happens next. Well, you got to buy the book. I got to buy the book. <laughs> All right. Our final reader for today is Emmy Itaranta. Emmy Itaranta is an award-winning Finnish author who writes speculative fiction in Finnish and English. Her debut novel, Memory of Water, has been translated into more than two in, to more than 20 languages and adapted into a film. She has also published two more novels, The Weaver and The Moonday Letters. Take it away, Emmy. Mm -hmm. So today I'm going to be reading from the Moonday Letters. I'll be reading from the first chapter because I find that that's the easiest way to kind of um, let you into the world of the book. I'm also doing a giveaway. I'm going to give away one signed copy of the Moonday Letters. So if you sign up um, for the giveaways, uh, you might get a copy of this book, which I will send to you all the way from Finland. 25th of February. 2168. A long distance starship somewhere between Jupiter and Mars. So, the empty space of the blank notebook opens before me as I turn the first page into view and write these words. I finished filling the previous book yesterday, the one with the green cover that you gave me for my birthday. I wrote the final sentences on the inside of the back cover. I wrapped the book in the bamboo scarf that was also a gift from you and pushed it into my suitcase under the clothes to wait for the moment when I can press it into your hand. But there is yet more to write before we meet again. Let me prepare everything for you, Saul. Set the stage and open the curtain so in your thoughts you may settle next to me and be with me in this moment. You said once that writing is journeying beyond infinite distances. With these words, I transport you to me across time and space. Imagine the deep blackness behind the wall. 
Imagine the faint and some rare bright spots sparkling in it, like scattered rain, into the heart of which the ship is journeying. Imagine the humming of the vessel's motors that are pushing it toward Mars. Imagine the smothering silence of space. Imagine the narrow bed of the cabin into which I invite you with me. Just like that. Sit down next to me, place your head against my shoulder and follow the movements of my pen. The blank paper is like a white sheet or skin wrapped in anticipation. The tail drawn on it, letter by letter, like the touch of the beloved. Ziggy is sleeping at the foot of the bed, curled into a striped coil, snoring faintly. The sound is so clearly distinct from purring that there is no chance of confusing them. Ziggy's ginger red ear triangles point toward the wall. His chin rests on his paws, and occasionally the paws twitch, moved by the threads of sleep. On the unfolded side table that is barely larger than this notebook waits my dinner. A metal bowl of soup bought in the cheapest canteen on the ship. Delicious hot or cold, read the digital display of the shelf. I have eaten similar bowlfuls often enough to know that neither is true. And I can hear you gagging when the smell reaches your nose. Are you here? So, yes, I can feel the warmth emanating from your skin. Ziggy's snoring pauses for a moment when he senses your weight on the mattress. I move my leg a little closer to you. Now that you are sitting comfortably, I want to tell you about Europa. On the first day six weeks ago, I stood up on the surface of Europa in a tower reaching far above the ice crust and looked toward Earth. I couldn't see anything but the enormous orb of Jupiter and the stars glinting behind it. If I had swiped one of the telescopes along the rounded walls of the tower with my pay bracelet and looked into the ocular, I might have been able to discern a pallid blue dot in the distance, but I did not do so. The vast windows of the tower were lined by information screens that updated regularly and portrayed the starry sky in different directions, depending on the positions of the celestial bodies. Here I could see the dim rings of Saturn. That way, its moons, Titan, Dione, and Enceladus. Over there, the ninth planet of the solar system, always invisible and therefore for a long time undiscovered. I thought of how far away from home I was. Part of me was startled by the realization. It marked a sore spot inside me. If anything were to happen here, an accident, a technical flaw causing delays, an unexpected moonquake and ice tsunami, everything was alien, I alone. But underneath the thought, I recognized another that burned like the sun. This was how far I had made it. I only wished you could have been there with me, so. And that's where I'm going to stop today. <laughs> I love it. That was, that last line was just, it resonated with me, shall we say. Anyway, <laughs> thank mm. you so much to everyone who came out today. Thank you.